last week, huh, here in Lexington? I wouldn't know if we were in Washington. More on that in a bit, but it was good to be out there with Brent's sister. But we welcome you this morning. We have some visitors, and if you're here for the first time uh, or just have come back, we hope that you feel just part of us. I especially want to welcome Linda and Mary Lee, our dear friend Peggy's good friends that we had dinner with last night. It's good to have you all here this morning. It's good to see you all this morning. Welcome. Absolutely. And of course, you can say we're missing one. We are. We're, uh, Pastor Pam is uh, at birthday weekend. And, you know, get as old as she is, it takes a whole weekend. <laughs> Get as old as she is, it takes a weekend to recover. Do you have that? Uh, is that camera recording? It's recording. Yeah. I'm in trouble. Uh, <laughs> we miss Pam, but we're glad that she and her husband are away at a cottage by a lake. And she has already texted Kenny and I both yesterday morning and this morning, sending her love and prayers for our service. Absolutely. Why don't we do this? Let's take a moment real quick and turn to those closest to you and hug a neck, shake a hand. Let them know how to like it. <laughs> have seven meals in them. It's a big deal. So we appreciate you all for supporting that and for helping us do that. We'll get them in the bins. We'll load the bins in our cars. And Cindy, I think you and I are going to deliver in the morning. Is that right? So. To Coventry Oaks. So that'd be great. Wonderful. And you know, there are always a lot of opportunities around BUCC to serve. And especially, you know, once the weather starts warming up and everything, we have even more opportunities. If you'd be interested in being a part of the service, maybe to serve as a diaconate or to help with any of the other parts of the service, there's always a lot of hospitality, hospitality, and nosh, and set, helping us to set up for the services. You're more than welcome to do that. We have sign-up sheets in the fellowship hall, so you can take a look at those and see what slots are available, and take advantage of that. And then I'm excited about this book discussion coming up. I am too. You know, Daniel Beasley, who's also not here this morning because he is singing. I think the song by our friend Mark Miller, "Child of God," that we've had. Uh, Kenny said from the beginning, that's a Daniel song, and we've been gifted so many times, it's become sort of his mantra. He sung it at Interfaith Services, and today he's at Central Baptist Church with our good friend Mark Johnson, singing Child of God. Uh, so he was supposed to sing last Sunday, and they were canceled as well. But uh, many of you know, uh, Daniel's also working on his social work degree, and he told Pastor Pam that this book called Stamped from the Beginning, the Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America is one of the most powerful books he's read. And so we ordered those. There's some on the table. I have downloaded mine on uh, my, my iPad. Uh, but you're invited to, if you want to take a book to share, you want to download on your Kindle or something. But then with Seenagers, which this month for February is going to be February the 9th instead of the 2nd, We'll all gather with the Seenagers, whoever's interested, and Daniel's going to lead a book discussion of this. I've started reading it. Uh, it is not one of those reads that you can pop up by because it takes so much time to reflect. So even for the book discussion, we're, he's going to focus on the first two chapters, but yeah, feel free to grab one of those and be reading it. It's an important thing for us to be reading, and uh, next Sunday starts, uh, February is Black History Month, so we want to acknowledge that and be very aware. Absolutely. And then, of course, you know, we say every Sunday, we believe that no one should ever be hungry. We have a thing here we call a notch. It stands for No One Stays Hungry. If you're here this morning, you'll notice on your way out the door, there's some food that's just sitting there. 
and it's for those folks who may need a meal today, or maybe you know someone or pass someone along the way between here and wherever you're going after service, you can pick one of those up and, and uh, take it uh, take it and, and give it to them. Kenny, can, can we say right before we finish our All Are Welcome song that, you all know, we've been collecting blankets here in the month of January, and we've been doing that with a lot of other churches, many churches that don't share our theologies or beliefs or even our inclusiveness. It's a wonderful way, though, that we can agree on one thing, to feed people, to make people warm, try to get folks in homes. Our goal for all of our churches combined was 200 blankets before today, and you all see we have a pile at the door ready for them to pick up again. We've collected this conglomeration of churches over 500 blankets that we've distributed to the homeless community in Lexington. So, thrilled to be a part of that. That's what we do when we work together. Absolutely. <coughs> so let's sing. <coughs> Let us build a house where And to nurture this foundational aspect of our very being. So that it can give us renewed energy for passionate work, for even some delightful play, and for creative problem solving to make this world a better place for all. Our sweet spot. 
If you felt like you didn't have to do everything or fix everything, what one thing would you work on at this point in your life? What do you feel drawn into? In the world of the driven, let us be drawn. God, draw us into your story of hope and give us the courage to dream. Amen. Would you stand with us this morning as we sing our opening hymn? Presence of our Creator. 
Artist Pablo Picasso said, every act of creation is first an act of destruction. That means that whenever God leads us into new territory in our lives, the way we've always done life will change. Something will be different. Sometimes what holds us back, friends, is our fear that if we just don't plow forward in our old ways, we won't be able to handle the change. So hear this good news. You can handle changes. Why? Because God is with us. In a minute, I'll invite you to turn to your neighbor and say these words, You've got this. <laughs> and the truth is, we don't need to know what each other come in here this morning and are struggling with. We don't need to know that each of us might be struggling to change in our lives in, in order to create more goodness and more freedom. We just need to remind each other with authenticity that we're not alone and that we are supporting each other. So would you turn to someone close to you and just say, you've got this. Remember the safety of a good fort. Bedspreads draped across chairs, weighted down by giant books, with a tunnel leading under the card table. Maybe there was a hole in one of the bedspreads. Put there so you could peer out unseen. <laughs> you might pass a stack of comic books or a roll of cookies into your fort and stay there all day in the dull glow of bedspread light. <laughs> the fort was your refuge, your secret spot. The interior untouched by adult hands <laughs> or eyes. It was a world you built for yourself. What if we could remember to build a world of forts made with blankets, where we each had time to focus, to hover in a quiet, dull light of bedspread light. Our scripture this morning is from Luke. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during these days, and when they were over, he was finished. He was famished. The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority. For it has been given over to me, and I will give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on a pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. Well, as I sort of said in the opening this morning, Brent and I just returned from a wonderful visit to Seattle. 
we were able to pull off uh, surprising Brenda's only sibling, Tricia, as Tricia's husband, George, and many friends in the Seattle area gathered to celebrate Tricia's 60th birthday. And those of you who may have access to Facebook may have seen the video of the complete and very touching surprise. Perhaps this birthday had a bit of a sweeter taste because we were also in the spirit of gratefulness for Tricia's two-year clean scan after a tough journey with breast cancer. After the party was done, albeit it took Tricia a full day to recover from that, Ren and I were able to take in some of the beautiful nature in Seattle. Crisp, fall-like days, much warmer than you all had in Kentucky, enabled us to take long walks in Tricia and George's neighborhood. And if you've been to Seattle, you know that it's so focused on environment and outdoor activity that even within residential neighborhoods, there are these pathways and walks through the woods. And we weren't, when we weren't taking long walks and we ventured out in their car, George and Trish shared with us some of their favorite places to visit. We spent a full day in Skagit State Wildlife Recreation Area. It sounds like a really big place, but in truth, it's a very, very small place, but beautiful. And the attraction to that place is to watch birds. It's about two hours north of Seattle, and it's not just any birds, but this time of year, it is bald eagles. And we were fortunate enough to have spotted two of them, as well as literally thousands of snow geese and seagulls and, and other birds of the Pacific Northwest. Our hike of sorts took us right to the boundary of Puget Sound, so everywhere you looked, there was water and nature and just sheer beauty. What a view. The following day, we drove to Sulkami Falls. It's an active, powerful, beautiful waterfall. And then we joined hundreds of others hiking to the bottom of the falls. And once again, what a view. The view from above was wonderful. The view from below was breathtaking. And for the first time in my now three visits with Bryn to Seattle, I get why folks are willing to tolerate a seemingly year-round misty and cloudy sky. And yet when the sun is out, the Pacific Northwest is pristine. And it just smells so clean. Add that to the progressiveness of thought, and it's no wonder people make that area their home. Over those four days of being in Seattle, I can't count the times I thought to myself, wow, what a view. This morning, we find Jesus experiencing a view from the mountaintop, leading out of the wilderness. Although, make no mistake, it was far from a tourist attraction. Rather, our scripture story today is one of the toughest for me to read and to reflect upon. For any time I become more keenly aware and am reminded of how poorly Jesus was treated, how he suffered, I become very sad. And yet, because we're also gifted with lessons about how Jesus dealt with the realities of the world, I live with hope. And perhaps you might as well. During this Epiphany series, we're contemplating about being drawn in. And part of that process is for us to be intentional about connecting with our creativity, with our life's purpose, and how to get to that and, and through that, and, and how to recognize that our creativity and our purpose changes as the years go by. When we last gathered on January 13th, we talked about dreaming. And we were invited to dream wildly, without self-inflicted boundaries. We were invited that as we dream to think about the very essence and preciousness of our life. <clears throat> and so this morning we continue in that reflective spirit and we join Jesus in a very pivotal place in his life's journey and his ministry. The scene is the wilderness and the timing could not have been worse. 
Those of us who have experienced baptism in one form or another might remember that feeling we may, we had when we either came out of the water or finished with the sprinkle. It seemed like that water made us more whole, and for at least a few weeks we were fresh and ready new Christians. We may have refrained in those few weeks of envy of our friends whose lives seemed to be in a lot better shape than ours. We may have been on our best behavior relative to our language and our honesty with each other. I mean, it really seemed, at least to me at the tender age of nine, that I came out of the water and I was flying high on Jesus. <laughs> this morning, the time we know about is in this wilderness experience of Jesus was right after he was baptized. And so, if you just backed up a few verses, what you'll read is that Jesus went from coming out of the water and hearing, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased, to bam, in the wilderness, alone, hungry, confused, and I'm even going to go out a bit and say a bit ticked off. And who finally joins him? Not a friend. Not a family member. But his most staunch adversary. The devil. Now, I know in our faith community here at Bluegrass, we have a variety of beliefs about what the devil might be or look like then and now. In fact, we probably see some folks or maybe have some in our family that we think look a lot like the devil. <laughs> we sure have some in our country. But at Bluegrass, that's what makes us beautiful. It really does. It's what makes us this beautiful weave of people who can become church family with different beliefs, and different theologies, and yes, different politics. It's also what makes it quite challenging for your pastors. But whatever might be your belief about the devil, here's what we can conclude together. This story, friends, is about what happens when someone or something tries to be a negative influence on who we are and who we're called to be. And while these people or influences can create havoc and make us uncomfortable, they can also serve as an extraordinary purpose in that these experiences can give us a wider perspective. A view with a wide-angle lens, so to speak. Oftentimes, these experiences or people help us know what we don't want to be. A view that allows us to narrow down our focus on what's really important. Living through these really difficult life stretches can allow us to just hover a bit. Because these speed bumps slow us down, and as some of us have learned the hard way, ignoring speed bumps can cause real damage to your vehicle. And like fashion, ignoring speed bumps in our life's journey can wreck our being. I'm going to bet that Jesus, having found himself in the wilderness immediately after this baptism, thought, wow, this is not what I expected. And before he could figure out the what next, he was approached by his enemy. And so we get to, in this scripture over here, Jesus' internal hovering when we read of his temptations by the devil. Now in Hebrew, the devil is called Satan, which means adversary or accuser. Anyone here ever been accused wrongly? In the wilderness, this adversary or accuser tried to throw off Jesus' focus by shifting it in a direction that was not his sweet spot. For Jesus to be tempted, the adversary would have to take one of Jesus' great loves and use it to take him and disjoint him off center. So what we find in the scripture is the adversary trying to create this misdirected focus so he can send Jesus' energies in the wrong spaces. So what do he do? What do a lot of folks do? They go for the things we love. 
So the adversary pulled out three of Jesus' great loves, feeding the hungry, working for justice, and gathering a community of committed disciples. None of those loves were evil. In fact, they're good, and Jesus acted on each of them during his ministry. But here, the adversary simply tried to misjoint that, misrepresent that, and turn it into negativity. Before he said, hey, turn stones into bread, Jesus. You know you want to feed the world. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. You know you long for God to be the world's true leader. Show the world evidence that you're the Messiah. You know you want the world to hear your voice and follow God. See, all of these temptations represented a part of Jesus' call. But they didn't represent his entire call. And they didn't represent in that place and time what he was called to do. Make himself appear greater and higher and above everyone else. His great love of feeding the hungry and creating justice and, and gathering a community of believers was meant to serve God's purpose, not his own. So like the rest of us, Jesus had to hover. He had to think about these things. He had to resist that temptation for his life to be all about him. Jesus had to figure out, just like we do, friends, what his calling was and where his passion was. What were his gifts for ministry and presence in the world? You know, it's just the case for us. Everyone doesn't have the same gifts. Jesus' gifts were different from John the Baptist, or Paul's, or Mary's, or Moses, or Ruth, or Martha's. Jesus had different talents than they did. In fact, and Kenny, I don't know if you and Brenda have paid much attention to this, and others of you who like music, but I came to recognize in studying for today's sermon that in all the Scripture stories, there's not one of Jesus singing or playing a harp. So those of you without musical abilities, <laughs> you're just like Jesus. <laughs> Jesus was in this wilderness hungry and lonely and confused. And the adversary tried to tempt him into trying to be something other than what his calling was at that moment. We know there would be times for Jesus to turn water into wine, one of my favorite stories. We know there were times for Jesus to establish His unique authority and relationship with God. We know that there were times that Jesus was called to lead folks from many paths and invite them to be one in spirit. But this was not that time. This time in the wilderness was for Jesus to become self-aware and self-actualized in the midst of His weakest moments. And it's a good thing he got some grounding in this stretch, friends. Because the story following this one, Jesus begins his ministry going to the safest place in the world, his hometown, where everyone had seen this Jewish boy grow up. And he was rejected. The place where he grew up, the place he expected unconditional support, unconditional love, in hovering in the wilderness, Jesus found his grounding, his grounding of God's purpose and presence. Perhaps what we might learn from this story is that we too have to find our grounding. In the midst of some of the most difficult seasons. And it's a process. For most of us, the hovering process doesn't happen overnight. Few people have that road on Damascus experience in which God zaps us in some highly dramatic way with sure knowledge of what our paths should be. Even a 40-day retreat in the wilderness like Jesus did is unlikely to reveal what our sweet spot is. And who can take 40 days off work? I don't know about you, but my sweet spot continues to change. The hovering process involves a conscious listening to your own life, which will reveal to us what our sweet spot is. I love what the writer and poet Frederick Buchner says. 
And it's this. The place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Ah. The place God calls us to is the place where our deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. I love that. What is your deep gladness? What is it that makes you feel most alive? Most yourself? It might be making music, or it might be baking a pie. Maybe you lose track of time when you're delighted in figuring out how to fix a friend's computer or a friend's vehicle. Maybe you feel most alive standing in front of a classroom or at a soup kitchen. It might be several things, which is a blessing. Discerning among them is where the second component comes in. Where does your gladness intersect with the world's hunger? Where are your gifts most needed? And attending to the world's hunger doesn't mean you have to abandon your own joy or become a people pleaser. It just means you actively look for ways to make a difference with the gifts that bring you joy. Yesterday we had a church council retreat and I'm so grateful for those folks who are willing to be behind the scenes. And we talked about this yesterday. We talked about the fact that Bluegrass is a unique church. It's not for everybody. But it's for a lot, whole lot of people. So we ask ourselves, in 2019, what are we going to be about? And I love what Stacy Green came up with. You'll hear more about it. Back to the heart of it. What is in our heart? What outreach is in our heart? What brings us joy as this faith community? And where and how does that intersect with the hunger, the need, the yearning of our community? Hovering is a process of trial and error. So whether as individuals as a church, we need not feel badly about mistakes or dwell on the error. You think you're called to do one thing, only to realize later that maybe you were motivated by prestige or pleasing your parents or a significant other or making everyone in town think that you were all it. We need not fret about the dips and valleys of the hovering process. Because every apparent failure is, in fact, teaching us something valuable. Nope. That wasn't my sweet spot. That ain't it. So my friends, trust in the process. And be intentional about relying on God's view of your life and your calling and not the world's. You can find and we can find that convergence point and hover over our life loves and adjust the focus till they work in concert with each other at that sweet spot. That part of God's dream that, that you're called to fulfill. It's there. Trust me. It's there. And if you can't trust me, Trust God. No matter who we are, no matter our age or our race or our orientation or our identity, no matter our economics or our education or our religion or lack thereof, no matter if our lives are in a good, settled, solid space or in chaos, for we know in a blink all of that can change. We have an identity. We have a purpose. We just got to find out that view that is life-giving. And then hover. And then live as if life matters. Because, because my brothers and sisters, life does matter. 
so it's never too late to enjoy the view. I start looking at YouTube, 
<laughs> and lots of times I start pulling up Kenny Bishop. <laughs> Many of y'all know Kenny and his family sang for years Southern Gospel. Kenny and his friend Caleb Collins wrote that song. And I heard that on that Saturday. I knew what the sermon was. I knew what we were thinking about. And so yesterday morning we came for worship with her, so I said, Kenny, you're singing Never Too Late Tomorrow. <laughs> Marsha, I haven't sung that since the 70s. <laughs> I said, well, tomorrow's a good time to brush it off. <laughs> Kenny, you're so gifted. Amen. It's not just your music, which we all know that, but your heart and your spirit. Thank you for reminding us it's never too late. something that was broken in the scene. And in the scene below, it's been healed, it's been fixed. What do you see? What one thing do you imagine would make your life and the lives of your family and community, the life of our church, what one thing do you imagine would make it so much better? So I invite you to open your eyes and, and take a moment, if you had paper given to you on the way in, write that word on the paper. If you didn't, think about that word or that phrase, expressing what you see. I'm going to offer some prayers on behalf of our community. <coughs> and as I mentioned in the sermon, one thing that makes us so unique is that we can gather just as we are with our different beliefs and we acknowledge that. We also acknowledge that we may name with God different names. Some refer to God as Father, some as Mother, some as Parent, some as Creator. 
I believe that God is beyond anything we can imagine. And so I think of God as, as all of those things at different points in my life. And this morning as we do our Lord's Prayer, we will refer to God as Creator since we are trying to be very intentional about acknowledging that created spirit in us. So let us pray. Oh God, we gather this morning coming from different paths and different ways with different needs on our hearts. And so right now in our silence, we first pray and lift up to you those, those worries and tensions and anxieties that only we know have us weighed down this morning. God, we gather as community thankful for this faith community of bluegrass and asking for your continued vision to us and with us. And may we find that our joy and our gladness and our sweet spot is intersecting with the needs of our community. So get us out of the way of your spirit and let it flow and blow wildly through us and in us. God, we lift up just now, all of us, names of people in our life who need healing from medical diagnosis or journeys, either expected or unexpected. What might those names be, church? You can just lift them up. We pray for our friend J.R. Zukowski. Thankful for his successful surgery, but still prayerful for healing. God, we lift up to you those names of folks who are still grieving. We understand, oh God, that grief comes in so many forms, from the physical loss of folks that have gone on to an eternal presence with you, from loss of relationships. God, we lift up to you names of those who are addicted, who are lonely. We pray, oh God, for your peace. We pray for our country. We pray for our leaders from both sides of the aisle. We pray for all those who have been affected by our government's inability to work together for the common good the good of everyday folks. God, help us to have a, a spirit of compromise and understanding. And it's hard sometimes. But we know that you call us to pray for each other, to love when it's hard. You also call us to work for justice and to give voice to those without voice. In our thankfulness for being present this morning, we pray to you, O oh God, together, our Creator, which art in heaven, <coughs> hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our, our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever.
draw people into fellowship around a meal. His actions were out of the box in terms of who he dined with. Perhaps he sensed that when food and drink is filling our bodies, people's guards come down just a little bit. And we see our common humanity in common hungry bellies. Perhaps it's a good model for us to think about how church could sometimes get out of the boxes. So we come to the table to be reminded of this radical, hospital, creative Jesus that we follow. We follow his example, welcoming all who are hungry for love, for fellowship, for connection and inspiration. Welcoming all hungry for life. God set in motion the grandest creativity project of all. Light where there was no light. Waters and land, creatures on food, foot and wing, beauty and laughter. And we remember God called it all good. Out of that goodness we came. With gifts of the Creator, we were invited to begin our own lives of creating, making and building and Planting and crafting and fashioning and singing and sitting. Sometimes we got sidetracked and forgot this calling. Sometimes we destroy instead of build up. But you, O oh God, keep repairing our lives, calling us into the joy of relationship, reminding us that it's never too late. And so we proclaim with the saints of all time and place, repeating after me, Holy, Holy, Creating God. Holy, Holy, Creating God. Everywhere we see Your glory. Everywhere we see Your glory. Blessed are they who are drawn in. Blessed are they who are drawn singing in. Singing the heart song of love. Singing the heart song of love. God, Your creativity knows no bounds. In the fullness of time, You came to us fashioned in our own flesh and blood. In sending Jesus, your Son, and our brother, you created human and holy connection and showed us what love really looks like in public. Preaching good news to the poor, proclaiming release to the captives, recovering sight to the blind, setting at liberty those who are oppressed. I invite our diaconate to come forward. This morning we remember this meal that Jesus shared with his disciples and many, many others who were there that night, all hunkered down in fear and confusion, perhaps feeling a lot like Jesus did coming out of the wilderness. And I've read all the gospel accounts of that story and I can't find any rules, but churches sure have made a bunch of Jesus said to everyone in there, you're welcome here. And we know there were doubters, and deniers, all kind of folk in there. Jesus welcomed them all just as we are welcome today. So he gathered that night, knowing that it would be his last night with them. And he took a loaf of bread. He blessed it, and then he broke it. <coughs> he said, take and eat. This is my life that I've lived for you. Jesus was born and died as a Jewish man. And it was the Jewish custom after supper to drink from a cup. And so in that fashion, after supper, he took a cup and he blessed the cup. And he said, this cup is a sign of my covenant with you. It's my promise that I'll never leave you.
Jesus said, although I will not be here physically with you, my spirit will continue to live in and through you. He said that to them. He meant that for all of us. <coughs> and so what shall we do? I invite you to repeat after me. We will break ourselves open. We will pour ourselves out. In food for the hungry. And love for the stranger. Just as Christ suffered all, so too shall we. We will rise to new life and commit to create. Pour out your spirit upon us in this moment, O oh God, so that we might know your presence and power in our lives. Make us one that we can co-create your reign on earth as it is in heaven, as we just prayed. So God, let this bread and fruit of the vine fill us with your spirit for work and play in loving creation and each other fully. Let the people say, Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So be it. So be it. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. You are invited as the bread passes to take a piece of bread. And then after a time of meditation to drink from the cup. hospitable God, we give you thanks for what you created in this moment. This moment of our sharing, this moment of more connection to you and answering your invitation to the table, this moment in more connection to each other as we share the common elements, and more connection to the world as we made our vows to share this abundant grace in our world. Oh God, as we prepare to take our morning offering, we are thankful for all the gifts that you've given to us, for the gift of our precious lives, for the gift of health for those of us who enjoy that health, 
for the gift of promise, for the gift of hope, for the gift of peace. <clears throat> we know we can rely on you for these gifts, and you've also created us uniquely. And God, we, we ask you to, to call us to use our gifts for your purpose. Do not leave us. Do not allow us to deny what we can give to the world. Because it's easy for us to get so beat down and think that we have nothing to offer. We're too old, we're too young, we're too this, we're too that. When in truth, we each have a purpose. Call us to weave those purposes together. And so that when we pray the Lord's Prayer every Sunday, it is not habitual. But it is, it is intentional prayer to make things on earth as it is in heaven. To forgive others just as you have forgiven us. And so God, our prayer is that these offerings, however we give, in time, energy, commitment, and resources, every gift be used to proclaim this wildly inclusive and unconditional love and grace that you have for all of us. May it be so. So what do you intend to do to flex your creative muscle? Lifting the spirit in your life and the lives of those around you. 
We are part of a wonderful creative community. There's so much talent and skill and creativity among us. Some of you may have seen this week, I sat at the piano and played a tune, and um, I think it was Kathy or Maureen, one put some words out, and someone else, Sharon Rodriguez, and so we've already got the beginnings of a new song. I say, Kitty and Teresa smile, and I think they saw it and commented on that song. But when we bring it all together, it's really amazing. In the Fellowship Hall, you're going to find opportunities to join with others in our church family to be artistic and creative. We're excited about some of these things we're going to be doing in the next few weeks. We're going to be painting mugs at the Mad Potter. And so there's a sign up for that, and then we'll be using those mugs here for our hospitality hour. Hopefully doing away with paper cups, so it also makes us more green, which is great. Some of us are going to go to paint on canvas, to painting with a twist, and I think we already have 15 folks signed up for that. So today, after the sign up for Mad Potter and painting for the twist, I'll make those reservations and just put a note on either one of those if there are blackout days or times that you can't do it. We're also going to be gathering here this Wednesday night at 6 to write some music. To maybe take some older hymns and think about how we can make that theology more progressive and use in the church and maybe even finish this song we started via Facebook this week. So 6 o'clock Wednesday, you're invited to come. If you'll sign up, if you're planning to come, we're going to provide pizza, so we'll know how many of those to get. <coughs> and then we have someone here in church that's going to lead us in a writing and journaling time. We'll schedule that later on. And then on February the 23rd, after worship, we're going to craft our life journey. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be using pictures from magazines and poster board to sort of glue that on and share our stories as we're comfortable. And the chefs in the room are going to make some soup and chili for us to share. We're also doing some of these things so we do get back to the heart of it. The heart of being together. The heart of getting to know each other. So look in the fellowship hall for those sign-up sheets. I also want to remind you that uh, my mom, she was a raise her hand there, has your giving statements for 2018. So if you'll see her, she'll be in the fellowship hall. As we're packing backpacks, you can stop by and see her. And she will have those letters if you need those for your taxes. And also, just a reminder to fill out one of these sheets. Even if you think we know everything about you, if you fill one of these out, we're going to make sure everyone's in Simple Church, which is our way that we can email or find numbers for everybody. And that's really important for us as pastors when we're trying to chase you down and check on you and see how you're doing. We're not going to come after you if you miss church a few weeks. But we do want to check in with you and make sure you're okay, make sure you don't need anything. So as we sing our closing hymn, maybe you've been thinking about joining our church family officially. And for us, that just means that you're saying at this point in your journey, this is the church that feels like home. If that's something that's in your heart this morning, I would welcome you to front as we sing together. Mm -hmm. 